Hi, I'm Father Andrew. And I'm Father Michael. And we're those two priests. And today, Father Michael, we're going to talk about the Annunciation Big oh, Feast. That's up. great news. It's a huge feast. We're actually going to sing the Gloria, right? Glory be to God. In Which Lent? We, in Lent! What's what going on? Oh my What's gosh. going on? We haven't been singing it <laughs> yeah. all of these Sundays of Lent. And then all of a sudden, the Annunciation strolls in and starts singing. <laughs> and we bring out flowers and the organ and... And all the sweets and all the and seems, foods that we have been eating. The only feast that we've had recently, it seems that in Lent we've had uh, a string of these with uh, Joseph. We had St. Patrick's in America is a big deal. That's like right. dispensations from abstaining from meat even. And, not right, here in Rome. Not, not here, here in Rome. We can get in on that party, I'm afraid. But I love in times of drought, like the the... The good things of the feasting, right? Because it really does, it's even more appreciated, I think, at at, at that time. Right. Um, One of my favorite saints, John Henry Newman, he said, only those who fast can truly feast. Mm. So we've been in this season of fasting. We've been in a season of abstinence. We've set aside a lot of really good and beautiful things to free ourselves from attachment. But now Holy Mother Church says, take a little break, enjoy, rejoice, celebrate this great feast, get some strength for the journey, and then go forward, get back to the fasting after. But the Annunciation is a day of celebration from the earliest church onward. It is sacred. God God planned things well, didn't he? To be born on December 25th, so as to be conceived on this day. And that's, of course, is why we celebrate it when we celebrate it, right? right? Because we're exactly nine months before December 25th. Exactly. And there's a, there's a sense of... We're even, we're even like in step liturgically with the mysteries of Christ's life throughout right. the calendar right. year. And so we can celebrate with Mary's Annunciation. Well, that's the wild part about our faith. It's so concrete. It's so incarnational, <laughs> right? It's saying time matters, place matters. Yeah. You don't just follow this distant God who has a set of abstract principles to guide your life. You follow a God who has come close to you. And he did that in a particular time, in a particular place, to a particular woman. Yeah. And so it's important. He's sanctified time. So we share in that. We rejoice in Well, that. let's do this, Father. Let's j- dive into this gospel passage with the hope that maybe people at home can do something similar. Even before right. they go to Mass on, well, the, the 25th isn't a Sunday. Right. But um, it's such an important feast. I think it's worth preparing for even even like you would a Sunday right. Mass. And that means looking at the scriptural, te- looking at the liturgical texts um, to, and meditating upon them to be so that it's fruitful in the moment of the public celebration. Absolutely. So I completely agree we should proclaim the gospel. But beforehand, I don't want to forget our many viewers from Middle Earth who may also <laughs> be tuning in. And I just want to say happy anniversary of the destruction of the Ring of Power. That's what we're celebrating. That took place on March 25th. Oh, shoot. That's not in my liturgy, but... <laughs> it happened on March 25th. So what Tolkien is... was very sensitive to this date and its importance. So the ring is destroyed and liberation comes okay. on this day that we citizens of this world wow. celebrate the Annunciation. Wow. So yes. just for all of our Middle Earth fans who are tuning in, it's amazing what the internet can do today. Happy anniversary. Wow, that sounds awesome. Well, Father, let's dive in with the reading of the passage first, and then we can get other exegetical nuggets like that one you just shared. Go ahead. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, 
How can this be, since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your kinswoman Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. And Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Wow, so this is a beautiful gospel, Father, and there's so much here. It, you know, it really just transports me to um, the Holy Land, where I went to the to the site of the Annunciation. Beautiful. And the, I, have you seen this space where the, the it's so vast, but yes. then nestled inside of this massive basilica is this little like cave or grotto, and then you see with the spot where it says, "And the Word became flesh." Here it adds it adds that little eek in in Latin, and it is a powerful contemplation. I'm the, on my way back. So oh, that's right. I've been it's once before. Oh, okay. I was very blessed first year of a ministry way back when in 2018. Yeah, and I'm excited to go back with Mountain, one of our oh our good friend Mountain, our absolutely. good friends. In fact, yeah, I think Mountain. I was last there with him as well. Yes. The the Catholic traveler. The Catholic traveler. <laughs> if you're looking for. A good pilgrimage. Do it. He, Sign up with the Catholic Easter. Traveler. Rome, Assisi, Austria, Holy Land. Sign up. He's not paying us for this yet. <laughs> he will. But go we'll to the Catholic it. Traveler. Okay. Yes. When you get that new influx of uh, pilgrims, you know why now, Mountain. That's why. We're sending them your way. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. So let's unpack this beautiful passage. I have to say, I have meditated on this a bajillion times. I think that's wow. the exact number. Yes. Um, but I'd say a bajillion rounding up to the nearest bajillion. <laughs> but... No, really, when I first entered the seminary, I think it was between this passage and the agony in the garden mm. that I just found the most fruit for my life. Like, I could propel myself into my day yeah. with faith, just contemplating this scene. Wow. So I want to un unpack this also um, from the very first verse, Father, because there is something of a puzzle here mm. in verse, and we started with, in the sixth month. Six months? Why, why the sixth month? Like, why not the first month? Or any other time, like six months since when? Right. right. And so it's clear that Luke isn't beginning his story here, but he's continuing a story. Right. And you re he assumes that you know what happened with Zechariah, mm. who also had a message from on high that told him that he would, his wife would have, uh, would bear a son that he ought not be afraid, that the Lord had this plan. Um, and so I want to just highlight these parallels because I really think that it gives the message of, the, of what we just read. It's not just the similarities, right. but it's a major, a major difference. Mm. But um, first, can I just draw attention to the similarities? One is that in verse 5, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest. He introduces the character in time and in space, and then there's uh, then he says um, the 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 message that comes from on high begins with "Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard." That sounds familiar, doesn't yes. it? Yes. With, yes. With very important side note: Please. you should be afraid when an angel appears to you because they're frightening, terrifying, incredibly majestic, strong fierce beings, right? Yeah. They are casting out Satan and his demons, right? Michael, the archangel, right? They are powerful. That's why through all of scripture, when angels come, people are frightened and they should be a little bit afraid. Yeah, I always like that about the name Michael. Is, isn't that the one that's who is like God, yeah. right? It's, it's, a question. Question. it's a question, but also like highlights this idea of God is so transcendent. He's so awesome. He's so glorious that there's this sense of nothing in the world of creatures comes close. And yet these unseen, these creatures of the unseen realm, these angels, are manifest that glory so much that even their um, participation in that glory, when it floods into this world, when it invades our space, 
it causes us to tremble. Yeah, not just cute little babies that we cuddle with, right? <laughs> yeah. So something important's happening here. If angels are going to all the trouble to appear, and then they say, all right, don't worry, this is gonna be good. Right. We're not here to slay you, we're not here to punish you, this is gonna be good. In both scenes, we're taken up into salvation history in a very, very special way. These, these, are, these are highlights of the story. Yes, and this is good news. I love that we call this passage the Annunciation. I remember one priest uh, that was there in um, a fr um, Franciscan, if I'm not mistaken, there in Israel was inviting me to the place, and he was he was questioning the appropriateness of this name because it, I think he wanted to highlight Mary's activity, her proactivity, mm. um, and it's true that she's plays a major role. But I think in the passage, what really is highlighted by the secret author is Gabriel's activity. Mm. It's his announcement that really is it's the way this intro is introduced. The angel was sent from God. He announces a message that is the large majority of the text is right. his announcement. And then Mary is going to respond um, with this great sentence, fiat miki, in the end. And, but, and that does capture our attention sometimes. I think it, it steals the spotlight. But it's worth unpacking. It's worth unpacking yeah, yeah. the actual message here. So you're saying in both stories, right, both parts of this chapter from Luke, we're dealing with an important message from an angel. We're dealing with some pretty exciting, extraordinary news, right? In both cases, births in unusual situations, right? In the first part, of an elderly barren. barren woman, and in the second case, a, a virgin who has not known sexual relations. Yes, that is, but it's also that God's activity is going to be entering into their space. Mm. And here's the question, what do we do with God's voice? How do we respond? And what we see is that the message is grandiose in both cases. Yeah. You know, he, uh, John has a, a mission from God. Uh, he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit, um, even from his mother's womb. Right. Um, he's going to go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. As we have, like, um, someone who is doing even greater works there. I mean, remember what Jesus said, of those born of women, none is greater than John the Baptist. And yet there's something even greater uh -huh. in the Messianic age, in the kingdom of heaven. And that, I think, is foreshadowed. We're, we're standing right at the brink between the old and the new, right? right? And, and so this has often been read typologically to say that Mary is the first little glimpse at the, the glory of new creation. Mm. Um, but we'll get there in a moment. What I want to hi highlight, however, is this response and the, the parallels here. How can this be, says Zechariah? How shall I know this? I'm, a, I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. Completely reasonable question, question. right? Because look, the people in the ancient period did not have all of the scientific resources we have today, so they didn't know as much about embryology that we know about today. But they knew where babies come from, right? They knew that the storks don't just <laughs> arrive with the fully formed infants, sure. right? So That's safe to say. They, yeah. they knew the basics of biology, and so he is understandably shocked when he's with this old lady. <laughs> How's yeah. this going to happen? And, but Gabriel says, I am Gabriel, who stand in the presence of God. I was sent to speak to you and bring to you this good news. Um, so here's the interesting part. What is not said by Zechariah? You wouldn't know, like, hey, he's punished on the one hand. Poor guy's mute. He can't speak. Yeah. He, he asked a question. Mary asked the question. Uh, where's yeah, her punishment? Exactly. But this is exactly how Luke highlights the difference. What he didn't say, what he left unsaid, is what Mary now proclaims. And it's a hint for our holiness, too. Mm. This is the effect of this juxtaposition with all these similarities, some 10 or 12 of them in the Zechariah passage, now reproduced in the Mary passage, but... Her end point is this, verse 38. Behold, I'm the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to your word. That ought to sound familiar. These words, let it be done to me according to your word, doesn't remind you of what you read about God himself when he comes to this world through the incarnation, 
the Behold, sun. Behold, I come, come to do your will. will. That's it. That's it. So that's the definition of Christ the Son as he moves from his heavenly throne into our earthly realm. He says, I do so with this attitude. This is like my emblem, the one thing that defines my coming. I come to do your will. Well, here Mary is imaging that exact attitude as she says, let it be done to me according to thy word. And so, yeah, she's, I think the effect of this is that we read Mary as the image of the disciple. She's a Christian par excellence. I, I want to linger a little bit more on these fascinating parallels and contrasts, okay. right? Because, yes, Mary is the disciple. She's the model of faith, and she gives herself wholeheartedly to the surprises of God. And this is pretty surprising. Mm-hmm. But she is not naive. We saw, just like Zechariah, she asks the good question, how can this be? I wasn't planning on having any sexual relations. Yeah. How do you make sense of this question? I, this doesn't fit. I know something through my reason. I know that I have not had sexual relations. And a lot of early Christian writers, St. Augustine, St. Gregory of Nyssa, and others say she actually made a vow of virginity and she wasn't going to have sexual relations. So she's trying to fit this together. But instead of saying, I know this by reason, therefore no to faith, or instead of saying, well, here comes faith, so forget about reason. Yes, 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 whatever, whatever it may be. She says, how can this be? Right. Yes, whatever you wish. But how can this be? So this is great. Being a believer does not exclude questioning. In fact, I would say being a real believer, following Mary's model of belief, Mm -hmm. includes questioning. If you're a good believer, you should be questioning. When you find a difficulty, when something doesn't quite make sense, ask the Lord for clarification. Ask the church for clarification. Search, research. She's a model believer and a model researcher she's a model searcher yeah she's seeking the truth i love if and some have suggested that that question how can this be only makes sense if she has a vow of virginity because look if she were just asking how can this be um i i don't know a man we'll get to know one could be Who the answer i'm already betrothed <laughs> to. to that like, would that be a good would option pretty, <laughs> i mean that does certainly leave room at the very certainly compatible with a vow of virginity if it doesn't already suggest that but um also what i find in this is, so you've, we've highlighted two things so far that she's the model of discipleship the one thing that christ can't do which is always a bold claim like whoa jesus can't do something Well, yeah, he can't imitate himself, right? He can't give us a picture of following Christ because he is Christ. But Mary is doing that. And here, we don't get much about Mary. But the few things that we do get, and right from the start, really pinpoint her importance. Mm -hmm. So what what is highlighted is absolutely essential. She's um, the new Eve, we might say. I think this is the language that's getting... Remember how, of course, Eve is the mother of the living, as, right. as she's described there in Genesis. But we're going to have Mary being mother of God here, yes, but she's also um, our mother. She's presented at, in some way as this kind of figure who is the preeminent member of the church, modeling for us, the rest of the members in the church, how to go about living this out. So I want to see if we can unpack some of this imagery yeah. that, that, can I steal a quote from Irenaeus? I was researching. I was just thinking about him because I was going to call you out. I'm like, this is a great idea, but, but you didn't come up with it. Yeah. I've heard this before. Yeah, exactly. No, I don't, I don't pretend <laughs> to have invented this out of nothing. But when our catechism quotes this very passage, let it be done to me according to your word, it cites St. Irenaeus. And I should, I should read just a little bit. Now, we're going back here. We're talking about second, second century, century theologian, right. maybe the first systematic Western theologian right. uh, of the Catholic Church. So this is going deep. This is not some medieval papist invention. <laughs> no, but let's read from St. Irenaeus because he, he makes this parallel. He says, being obedient, Mary became the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Hence... And I should quote that this is um, adverse heresies. The um, how do we say that in English? Against, against the, heres- the heresies. Against the heresies. Yeah. Um, yeah. That should be our next episode. Against the heresies. We'll take them on. So this is strong language. She's the cause of salvation for herself 
to this obedience of faith and for the human race. Hmm. Hence, not a few of the early fathers gladly assert, quote, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's obedience. What the virgin Eve bound through her disbelief, Mary loosened by her faith. That too is St. Irenaeus. And it, it explains, comparing her with Eve, they call Mary the mother of the living and frequently proclaim death through Eve, life through Mary. Okay, so if sin came into the world in, through the first Eve, okay, redemption is, come, is being worked out by she who says, amen. She right. who says, fiat miki, right. untying the knot right. through obedience, through love and trust. Um, precisely in the way that Eve became the mother of the leaving by saying the opposite of amen, by saying, I disobey. I choose my own way. Not she followed the wiles of the evil one of Satan, right? In chapter three of Genesis, yeah. saying, God's holding something back from you. He's keeping you from this tree and good of, of good and evil. If you just took it, you could be like God's too. He's a restraint. He's, right. he's really just suppressing you. Go forward, assert yourself, Eve, assert yourself. You do you. That was, I think that's the living standard translation of the, the gospel. I have to go <laughs> back you. go that's... back to the, the Hebrew text, but I think you do you is a pretty oh, wow. good satanic message. And it's the like emblem of our day, which I think is so interesting that when Paul would talk about Mary, he would say in the fullness of time, in the fullness of time is like the... The story of salvation was meant for this type of response mm -hmm. to God's revelation, the one that Mary gives. We can't overemphasize this, it seems to me. It's like the you do you that is so prevalent today, but that, that's an age old temptation. And it's, this is really the question is like, are you going to be your own protagonist? Are you going to go for the ego drama? You know, loves to highlight this is Bishop Barron, uh -huh. right? I, I think he's drawing from, is it Fons or was. Hans Urs von Balthasar. Yeah, the theodrama. The theodrama. theodrama. The theodrama on the one hand is that story that God wants to tell. Right. But here's the question. Like, are you going to play your role in that story? Or are you going to go do your own thing on the side and be, you know, the king of your own little, uh, in your own pond? I don't want to be a small fish in God's pond. Right. I'd rather be the biggest fish in my little puddle. Right. Right. And, and what we find out is that if you do that, you become a slave. You become you so quickly... You're not, your, your space, your space doesn't open up. Your, your space is becoming closed and small. Your, your silly ego drama in the end is not one it of brings misery. It brings misery, not flourishing. And to highlight that, think about what happens when Mary says yes to the theodrama. When Mary embraces her role according to the indications of the director. Does that bring slavery? Does that bring suppression? Does that bring misery? No. Who, which woman, which human person in all of history has been more successful? <laughs> Who has more poems, songs, cathedrals Painting. dedicated to her? All generations no. will call you blessed. No. You can do your own thing and be kind of sad and sorrowful in the corner and grumpy. Yeah. Or you can say yes to God's plan. And all generations will call you blessed. Oh, uh, okay. You're stepping out of this scene, and I love it. I love it. Because this is the way Catholics read the Bible. We, we see the totality, the big arc. And if you think about this, like every time we take up the rosary, we're looking at, isn't it so much of Mary's itinerary is part of our focus? Mm -hmm. Precisely because she's imaging every single Christian's itinerary. Right. And where does it end? Okay, so there's this glorious story of this little Nazareth. Isn't on the map some like lost outpost of the Roman Empire. Like what like that's Jerusalem and then way in Nazareth this yeah, is like no hillbilly. Country. What good can come out of that place? And that's where the the word became flesh. In any case, where does her story end? Uh, okay, so we read how she accompanies Christ, but then after his death and resurrection, she receives the Holy Spirit. She dies, goes to heaven with the assumption, and then is crowned. And we believe that her body, even, is already participating in the glory of the resurrection. She's the, well, she already has this up front. That's where we're going to at the resurrection at the last day. But it really helps to have in mind one person that's already gone that way. Jesus, the first fruits, and then his church. 
and like incarnated in the person of Mary that is embodied in this person. She right. is sharing in his resurrected glory now. Right. And that's, that's what we're tremendous. that's where we're going. That's, that's where we're going. So we can have the same confidence when the surprises come, when God is asking something of us that's challenging, that upsets our plans, we can be confident first by saying, Lord, how can this be? I don't understand. Help me, give me light, give me strength. It doesn't make sense, but may it be done according to your will because your plans are for my happiness, not for my misery. God never, ever, 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 not once, asks anything of us, no sacrifice of us that's going to lead us away from happiness. Every single sacrifice, difficulty that he may allow in our life <laughs> is so that we can be happy, yeah. is so that we can eventually reach the end of our pilgrimage and experience that glorification that Mary already enjoys. So what confidence and strength that gives right. to us. Right. And it is so related to the cross. The grace isn't, oh, Mary, you're always going to be happy. Therefore, you'll never have the cross in your life. Yeah. No, it's the opposite. Like, I'll give you strength right. to take up the cross. I mean, a sword is going to pierce her heart also is what it says in the presentation, right? right? right. So I don't know if there's anyone who has suffered more in the sense that watching her son die before her eyes in the most brutal way by crucifixion, I, I'm sure she would gladly say, I will take his place, take him down. I would more easily suffer it myself than to watch, you know, the fruit of my womb die in this way. It was a spiritual martyrdom, that piercing of the heart. Right? And so what of this freedom, Father? What of this happiness that uh, God, God gives us? This is the theodrama that I don't think any of us would pick, which is why we prefer the ego drama. Let's face it. Yeah. Like instant I'm, gratification, right. comfort. Not the cross. And yet the, the strength that comes, and this is why she's heroic. Heroic. You see, she says, no, I'll trust in God's providence that there's per crucem ad lucem, through the cross to the light, through death to new life. She accepts that central tenet of Christian faith. And that's what makes, this is what I think is so hard for the disciples. Right? Remember Peter? He's like, oh yeah, you're the Christ. So therefore you don't have to suffer. And then Jesus is like, no, get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking right. like God thinks, but as man thinks. Right. Mary's just the other way around. She says, amen. She accepts what's difficult. And there's a lot here, even in this message. Okay, she, yeah, the son is going to be great. Look at the adjectives here. Can I zoom in on this a second? <laughs> to say the least, okay, the, the son will be great. <laughs> yeah, he'll be great. That's the first thing. He will um, be called the son of the most high. That's two. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. That's three. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. In fact, his kingdom will have no end. Four. These attributes, these qualities that he's describing are clearly reference to the Old Testament. Mm. It's not just any king. It's not just any kind of greatness. That it, but he's going to be a Davidic Messiah. Like, we cannot... Um, for, uh, uh, emphasize this too much, I think. Yeah. It's like you cannot understand what he's coming to do apart from the Old Testament. But let's rehearse that story for a second, because to Abraham, kings were promised that Israel is going to be set apart because God was going to give them his rule on earth as in heaven, and that was going to set them apart. But what happened of that kingdom? Sure, it started really well with David and Solomon. Right. But how, I mean, Break apart. right right, apart, right from the beginning, right there in, um, I mean, it was in Rehoboam already starts to divide the kingdom. So it's like, yeah, that was a promise, but what became of it? And then those northern tribes completely destroyed. Assyrians the Assyrians come, come ruin their out. life. Yeah. And then it wasn't long after, maybe a couple centuries after. Okay, So that was 722 BC and 10 out of the 12 tribes are wiped out. Yeah. And then, where were you, Lord? Yeah, sixth century, we've got the deportation to Babylon for the kingdoms down we're south. In exile. In exile. We've lost the temple. Exactly. So this um, is utterly, like, I just I can't imagine living in those times and being in exile and be like, no, I still trust. Like, Lord, it's all, like, the throne that you promised, it's in the dust. Yeah. Psalm 89 is so descriptive of this. It's been profaned. The yeah. temple's been defiled. And now, what What of your promises? 
And it goes held- on and on and on for centuries and mm-hmm. centuries. And now in the time of Mary, okay, it's a little bit better, but we're under oppressive Roman rule. Right. Th- this seems to be the kingdom that's never ending. We still talk mm-hmm. about eternal Rome. If, if you're a reasonable person at that time, you're probably thinking, uh, unending kingdom? How about Caesar? <laughs> right. Not David. They, they must have laughed at that. Oh, yeah, keep trusting that a kingdom will have no end. <laughs> like, meanwhile, we're take turns ruling over you, all these foreign right. nations. And so what do we make of this? I think um, it's cool that the liturgy juxtaposes Luke's passage with Isaiah, mm. which says, um, the virgin shall, shall conceive... And they call his name um, Emmanuel. This, of course, is quite explicit in Matthew's birth narrative. But the elements are also here in Luke that this Davidic kingdom is goes on. Just that they feared that back in the times of Isaiah. <laughs> there's no good. There's not going to be a successor. You guys are done for. You know. But no, no. In his day, Hezekiah will be born. The kingdom carries on. The succession continues. So hang on to that hope. God is working. And so you might think of like a kind of preliminary fulfillment or a partial fulfillment in the times of Isaiah. But let's face it, like, is he really son of the most high? Hezekiah, really? Yeah, it doesn't quite fit this bill. Right, exactly. He goes on even in Isaiah 9, I think it is, that says, wonderful counsel, mighty God. Well, Jesus does fit the bill. Jesus will take that which has been destroyed profaned, defiled, that that throne which is cast into the dust, guess who's going to raise it up? Mm. And that's the best language, by the way. It's not just a restoration of the kingdom. It's a resurrection of the kingdom. And so in the resurrected Jesus is a picture of the restored kingdom. He will take up his throne. He's born with the destiny of that, but he's enthroned after his death and resurrection at the right hand of the Father, remember, Jer- Jerusalem, that's merely a shadow of a heavenly reality. Right. Heaven is his throne, earth his footstool. So the kingdom is sourced in heaven, but the radius of God's action extends even to earth below. Right. That's the kingdom that Jesus is taking up. And it starts to make sense of all these wild prophecies, like with Daniel uh, chapter 9 of the mm-hmm. Son of Man who will reign without end, who coming upon the cloud, coming upon the glory of God, reigning without end, everlasting kingdom. Is that just poetry? Well, it's real. Yeah. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, that's one of the other juxtapositions. What is it? Oh, no, I know what it is. And in Advent, we also read the Annunciation. And there, it uh, the first reading isn't from Isaiah 7. It's from uh, 2 Samuel 7, which talks about the son of David how his kingdom will have no end. It will be an everlasting kingdom. And of course, in Daniel 7, um, you have the son, one like a son of man, entering the throne room of God. Mm. And now, of course, this rhymes with what Jesus will do. And he himself quotes that passage right, right before Caiaphas to say, yeah. and you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And they know what that's about. That's... Blasphemous. Blasphemy. You rip your garments right. at that because they know he's taking on to himself divine prerogatives. Right. Only God can be equal to the, the, the throne. Only God can come upon that cloud. Only he can reign Yeah, he's forever. got God's authority. Absolutely. But here's what's so cool about that, that it's not just in Christ the head, but even in Christ the body, the totus Christus, that is sharing in the glory of Christ. And so I think in Mary, look at this, the Holy Spirit overshadows Ooh. her. This is very strong language, especially when you think of the Ark of the Covenant of old, yeah. right? Because that's where God's presence um, dwelt on earth as in heaven, overshadowing the Ark. And his presence is kind of like, almost like a visible sign of his invisible presence. Right. And, and Mary is now being uh, predicated in the same way that God's, the presence of the Most High sits on her. If I remember correctly, even the Greek term that it's Luke yeah, uses, yeah. uses here is very similar it's to what same. we find in Exodus 40, that overshadowing, that glory. Yeah, the episkiazo is the, is the word. So epi, over, right. and then skia is literally like darkness. 
And so there we get the a, a language of shadowing. Um, so you're exactly right with the the glory of the, uh, that fills the tabernacle is the glory that fills the temple. And now we have a kind of glorification in the new temple. Of course, John 1 says that the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. The glory, but where does it begin? Like one thing is his earthly body, like as he's walking around. In the first moment, he's in the womb of his mother. And so she's really, it's no wonder that once you see those parables, yeah. you get the early church uh, writers, early Christian writers, talking about Mary as the new, new ark. ark. The, the new, new ark, ark of the covenant. Which is very, I mean, what was inside of that ark? Let's revisit that for a second. Because inside you had the the tablets, the word of God, the Decalogue. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill the law, new Moses. Absolutely. And then you have the staff of Aaron. Mm, the, the true high priest, priest is now with us. Exactly. So there's Christ's priestly, but not one like the Levites, by the way, but he's he's going to be uh, of the order of Melchizedek. Mm. He's a, a very special priesthood that we have, as you said, high priest. And then finally the mana, right? right. The, what is this? Bread, right? The, I am the bread of life. <laughs> bread from heaven. Your father has eight men in the desert and they die. All of that is inside of Mary mm. um, for a first moment. And I think this is an image of the kind of fruitfulness that we ought to strive for. Mm. When we're trying to be productive, when we're trying to be good Christians, what is the good works that we're trying to do? More than anything, I think the way we fulfill that primordial command, be fruitful and multiply, isn't necessarily by just having babies. Yeah, that, that at one level, that's part of it. But the fruitfulness of Mary, look at this, even though she doesn't enter into sexual relations, is she, she is the mother of God. She brings God life, yes. Christ life into the world. And I think that's the kind, an image for the kind of uh, priestly life that we live. Remember, by virtue of our baptism, absolutely everyone in some way is a priest. And the priest is that bridge between heaven and earth who brings, God's down, brings God down, who brings up man's praises. I think the fruitfulness that we have to bring into the world is to bring Christ into the world, to bring the life that is proper to God. Right. Bring that into the world. Yeah, we speak of her as the Theotokos, right? The God bearer, the one who carries the Lord. Yeah. And she does that in a very privileged, unique way. Right. But wow, we can share in that. You think of the privilege we receive of welcoming, like Mary, she says, Fiat, may it be done unto me according to your word. When before we receive communion, we say, Amen. We we consent. Then we allow God to come within us. And then we're sent back into the world. And we're meant to radiate that divine life that we receive. There, what is that? You're reminding me of something. You know how Mary says, let it be done to me according to your word. But there's one phrase. I've, I want to say it's in Mark chapter 9. Um, I could be wrong about that. But where a, a, a disciple, uh, a one on the way, mm -hmm. says, let it, let it be done to me. And I'm not going to get it exactly right. But I'd have to... But I think the, the suggestion is that um, what, as Mary is imitating Christ, so the rest of us imitate Mary, who in turn imitates Christ. Like we're all tr called to, to kind of live in this space of abandon, a uh, space of surrender. Right. Like, um, I trust in you. And so I want your will to be done in my life. And so I think what we're striving for, and I'm still looking for this myself, Father Michael, is like, I want what God, I want to want for yes. myself yes. what God wants for me. Yeah. I don't want to just kind of like barely. If I have to. Okay, know. yes, exactly. Dragging my feet kind of thing. Yeah. But I'm honestly, if I look at my life, there are certain areas where there's still hesitation. There's still not that kind of, um, a little bit of friction there. And we still have these attachments. We still have this kind of this restraint at some level. That's what sin is doing in yes. us. It's holding us back. You were just reading before we went on air to be one of these beautiful nuggets from the catechism right. that speaks of how in this act of the Annunciation, Mary was unrestrained by any sin. That's powerful right. to think of being unrestrained by sin. Which but implies that, that sin restrains, yes. Yeah, so this is that same number of the Catechism 494, and it says, Mary, giving her consent to God's word, 
Mary becomes the mother of Jesus, espousing the divine will for salvation wholeheartedly. Oh, that's a good word. Without a single sin to restrain her, she gave herself entirely to the person and to the work of her son. And she did so in order to serve the mystery of redemption with him and be dependent on him by God's grace. That's so powerful because usually we think that we're restrained from doing what we want Hmm. and sin is just dabbling and kind of getting to enjoy ourselves a little Uh, bit. But in reality, it's the reverse. It's the sin that restrains us, the the sin that causes a bondage. At first, it's attractive, it's immediately gratifying, but then it tugs and it weighs us down and it prevents us, it holds us back. Whereas without that sin, there's that freedom to give ourselves wholeheartedly and to enjoy the Christian life. Not necessarily a life without pain or suffering, Mm -hmm. but a life of true peace and fulfillment. And that's what Mary models for us. Well, you've juxtaposed so well two things, uh, grace on the one hand and then sin on the other. Neither are proper to our nature, Mm. um, but both have effects upon our nature. So sin is like a poison that harms us and that keeps us from thriving. Um, Grace is like a medicine that elevates or perfects our nature. Um, But look at Mary, how she's described by the angel. I mean, this is God's messenger, and he greets her with the word kechairetomene in Greek, which is full of grace. Mm. This is so hard to translate, and in fact, even in English, we're probably closer to the Latin uh, gratia plena, right, right, of of, of St. Jerome, but it is hard to capture all the nuance here. The, just a little grammar. Uh, sorry to mention no, these I love categories. This. I okay, love so, this. But this is a perfect participle. Okay, so what this means is that some action has taken place. She has been filled with grace. She has been graced. And now the, the, the result of that is she is in grace. Kind of like you would say like, I have learned French means I know French. Right. right? So it's continue. The effects, the past effects exactly. continue onward and continue to shape me and influence me. Which suggests that something has happened already yeah. in the life of Mary, yeah. even before Gabriel ever. Right. She has been. So God, this isn't the first moment she's coming into contact with God's grace. Right. No, she's been graced and now she is. And this is her title. And so he says to her, Chaire which is literally high or hail. I mean, it's the way you would greet someone, Uh but the word that's used, the verb is to rejoice. And so some early church fathers here have have noticed the biblical motif of the joy of the daughter of Zion, Mm. right? That is rejoicing in the gift of God. And I think that's what's really happening here is that we have a little glimpse of eschatological joy right that was zephaniah and zechariah were telling hey what's the joy for jerusalem well god is coming to be your king Mm -hmm. and so this is the kind of joy that we're tasting it's not a flippant uh what's the groovy what's the what's that song like uh i'm I'm thinking of the simon and garfunkel feeling groovy okay uh, kicking down cobblestones and (laughs) I mean, there's a kind of earthly joy right. that's a grooviness. Real. A certain grooviness, grooviness is not a theological category here. <laughs> not but, yet. <laughs> but joy is. Joy is. And this is what Mary has. And it's not a mere creaturely delight or pleasure that we're talking about. There is something of another world that is infiltrating her heart. And so that whatever trouble she might have, whatever p- swords might pierce her heart, because she has that deeper level joy that higher ordered good, right. which is the life of God dwelling in her, she's able to weather all of those storms and then stand at the foot of the cross and enter into the very life, the very joy, the very um, the family bond that she has by virtue of grace. And, and that's filled her so much. It's so perfect. It's been so much part of her in the past before the angel arrives. <laughs> that the majestic, glorious angel that we spoke of earlier, graciously, if you will, humbly, if you will, acknowledges that. 
Yeah. And instead of just referring to her by her name, by Mary, he uses that title mm-hmm. as though to say grace is so much part of her that that's what the angel jumps to. Yeah. It's not even Mary anymore. She's so identified with the divine life that that's how the angel humbly salutes her. And, and that's the word, isn't it? We're, we're partakers of the divine nature, it yeah. says in 2 Second Peter 1.4. 1, 1, 4, 4, right? That is one of, the, I think, the most important insights you could possibly get from the New Testament. This is what grace does to us. It fills us with God life. And if you have that, you have what you were made for. If you don't, you're a walking contradiction. Yeah. Like, as, I love Augustine here. He's like, you made us for yourself, O oh Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. That's the, what Mary, why she's happy, because she has that eschatological rest of divine life. What a plot twist, right? Because we talked about Genesis 3. Eve, who foolishly strove to be like God by grasping for the tree of good and evil, she wanted to be like God. Mm-hmm. And now, through obedience, through the opposite response, humble obedience, Mary actually does achieve what Eve foolishly saw it. She is like God. And we can be like gods as well. We share that divine nature. Huge plot twist. Yes, that's awesome. Isn't that Frisina? There's a beautiful song by Marco Frisina we often sing in Italian. Um, But it says something like this. um, That fruit that that Adam couldn't eat Mm. is now given in Christ. There's so much going on in that one little lyric. But he's saying that on the tree of life, which is the cross, that which um, Adam lost through his disobedience, um, this communion with God, well, now it's given in a bigger and better way right. in Christ, who is now incarnate, who is now shared, shares in our nature, so that in that nature, he can communicate that which is his. God became man, so that man might become God, says St. Athanasius, Athanasius. And so, in Christ, we're going to be sharing in that life. Look, in Mary, we have a very good picture of that. As she's pregnant, like, the life that's in her, quite literally, even physically speaking at this moment, is, a, is, is not just human life. It's actually divine life because that's who's there, a divine person. And so it's a picture. It's a picture of what we're meant to be, to taste of this fruit. The fruit of her womb is, is Christ Jesus, the one who elevates us to divine life. What an incredible contrast we've been looking at, right? We're so tempted to think of obedience to God, just like Adam and Eve thought obedience of God would be a kind of slavery, a kind of deprivation, taking away from us opportunities and ways of success, ways of asserting ourselves. And we find in Mary quite the opposite. This trusting obedience, this openness to the Lord, the willing, even in the middle of all of the difficulties and obscurities and darknesses and confusions, that willingness to say yes to God in humble obedience actually opens up this path of fulfillment, of realization, of happiness, of joy, of divinization, right? Okay, so we've, we're like flying on the heights here in the right. clouds. I want to just translate that because that vision is not appreciated. I mean, think of the song that comes to mind, one that I had from the time of my, my childhood, is that of Billy Joel, you know, only the good die young. Hmm. And it's, it's really hard to go back and even like read these lyrics because they are so, but it is so widespread, this idea is that I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm sure if those who know the song know, know just the spirit that's there, it's that um, you, pious Christian, who are trying to be like Mary, saying amen, praying on your rosary, you know, you're, you're missing out on the, on the good stuff of life. That's, it's, it seems to them, and this is so ironic, because that, that's the small picture. I mean, we're, we're kind of looking down at those who would give themselves over to a life uh, following all their animal instincts and whatever pleasure. But they see it just the other way around, don't they? They say, look at you in your black cassock. Look at you living in a monastery. What's your, the schedule that you live? The, your, it's a small little world that you live in. Come on. I'd rather be able to go out on Friday nights, live it up, be part of the hookup culture and all the rest. Surely, 
surely I'm the one who's who's got it right and you you Father Michael have got it backwards. Right. I mean, is there any way that these two worldviews could possibly come together and even begin to understand the other? How would you even how would you even begin, Father? I don't know. Yeah, well, I think that we we're blessed with these models to actually show us concretely, historically, that this is possible. Certainly, we can go back to the Blessed Virgin Mary. We've already highlighted the fact that she has become a model of femininity. She has become a model of humanity. She's inspired the greatest poets, the greatest songwriters, the greatest architects to pour their genius into praising her. So she's done pretty well for herself. <laughs> Right? But then you can see in the lives of all of these great saints, these moments of fiat, these moments of yes. You can look at more recent saints like John Paul II or Mother Teresa, who sensed that call, that hint that the Lord was asking something big from them. And with perseverance and trust, they threw themselves into that and they became world altering forces. You can read secular accounts of the Cold War, and they're going to look at the figure of John Paul II and say, he shook the planet. He changed the political landscape, in addition to all of the other spiritual acts that he performed and all of the priests he inspired and all of the lay people and families that he guided. I remember years ago hearing the story about the young Carol Wojtyla, who was starting to think about his own fiat, his yes to the priesthood. And a lot of his friends came up and said, Carol, what are you thinking? You're such a talented actor. And if you stick with your craft and you set aside this religious nonsense, you could be the greatest Polish actor of all time. He could go places. Yeah. And and he said, okay, that's, that's nice. That's great. But I trust the Lord and I, I think he wants me to go elsewhere. And he clearly didn't know he was going to be Pope and he was going to help to end the Cold War and, and all of that. But he just made that act of trust and yes. And then if we step back and start reflecting, we say, okay, how many of our viewers, and please write in the comments if you know this, how many of our viewers could even tell us who the most famous Polish actor of all time is? Maybe Carol could have reached that, right? But he received something more, right? That yes, right. that fidelity brought out all of his talents. Right. What, what better stage could he have had? He was on the world stage. All of his training, all of his vigor, all of his enthusiasm, all of the dynamics of acting were put at the service of the Lord and brought him joy and happiness and fruitfulness beyond, I'm sure, his wildest expectations. So that's one example, but I think we can find it over and over again in the lives of the saints. So I don't think it's so much a theoretical problem as a matter of reminding ourselves of going back to history and saying, oh yeah, that worked. Oh, that worked too. Oh, that worked. Uh, yeah, and what's the common denominator? Because the saints are wildly different. Right. Very, very different cultures, backgrounds, formation, missions. But what unites them? Right. That spirit, that Marian spirit of, yes, Lord, be it done to me according to your will. And then suddenly, right. all of their talents and gifts flourish. Oh, that's so good. It reminds me of someone who says like, well, should I trust a GPS? Well, if I use it and it gets me where I want to go again and again and again, well, gosh, I, I guess it's a good tool. I guess it's a good map. I, I guess it's worthy of my trust. Um, on the other hand, the flip side of that is, not only do we have the saints who again and again find joy, find flourishing, find peace, you can just look at them and say, that worked for them. And it's, I think it's undeniable. Yeah. Um, but then there's the other side of that is that those who give themselves over to a, a wayward life in the way of the prodigal son who says, you know what, dad, I don't want your rules. I don't want your household. I'm going to do it my way. Yes. Okay, where does that leave you? And how many people have have had great success even, but then find themselves in a similar situation where they're just empty. Even I, I actually think of the success stories here, like you know who's been really good for me in this is uh, Jim Carrey, oh, yeah. who is wildly successful oh, yeah. uh, by every metric that the world, for, for, as far as the money that he's made, the, the movies that he, the popularity and fame and whatnot. 
but at one point he describes how I mean, he could buy anything that he wanted on the spot, anytime. And, and yet the, the great emptiness that he felt. It was a real crisis moment. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> By every measure, I'm supposed to be the happiest, and I'm clearly not. Um, and so there is nothing in the world of creatures that can satisfy that hunger that is unique in us for the infinite. And no matter how beautiful uh, your bride, no matter how... Um, majestic the sunset no matter how much money is in the bank no matter right. how much power you have right. those things good as they might be will never be of a of a common measure as the the grace of god the divine life that you were made for and i was thinking it's it's almost become trite now because it happens so often mm-hmm. to hear or read about the wildly successful rock star or model or businessman who reaches that point of realization of, I'm at the top of my field, I've got everything at my fingertips, all the drugs, men, women, both (laughs) that I could want, (laughs) truly at my fingertips, and I could jet to another country right now and be on the beach, and yet something's missing, and I'm miserable. And it's also sadly, tragically become almost trite because it happens so often Mm -hmm. to see these people die young, drug overdose, or whatever it may be, trying somehow vainly to satisfy that longing and dull that pain, that emptiness. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it's it's that sad flip side. <laughs> so I, I think it brings up this, this great point too about the Christian life of saying, well, if you are searching, if you are intrigued but uns- unsure, try it. Mm-hmm. Enter into that life. Read about it. We're intellectuals. We're professors. We can list a hundred books that give excellent, compelling arguments in favor of Christianity. Read, study, ponder, but also try to live it a little bit. Do the experiment because you've probably already done some of that other experiment. And we've done it before in our own lives of Mm -hmm. finding happiness elsewhere. You've already done the first Eve experience. (laughs) Try the new Eve experience. Yeah, interesting. You know, I'm wondering if Zechariah gives us something of an image of this because In not saying Fiat Miki, he becomes mute. It's like he has nothing to contribute. He has nothing to, of, I don't know if I'm reading too allegorically here, but it seems to me that are we, whatever noise we might be capable of making it when we're, when we're in that state, we really, we're not, we're not participating in the, in the great conversation as it were. He's sterile in that sense. Yes. There's a, there, there's a sense that. We, be, we find our voice when we say our amen. Mary doesn't say much. Like, it's remarkable. Like, we don't have great uh, speeches. Yes, we, the one thing that we do have is your great, um, the Magnificat, right. which, is so, which, which is mostly scripture, by the way. Right. Um, but there she's like, just taking up the praises of Israel to say, my soul magnifies the greatness of the Lord. And singing the praises, he has done great things in in me but what a picture of happiness that is like i love that about her and it's really i think a little hint at the vocation that we have to be to be blessed like isn't beatitude the inheritance that all christians share so mary's a picture of that too is that even in this life she begins to have a little taste of what we'll have in heaven face-to-face vision like in faith, this is what describes her. Remember, um, blessed is she who believed in the promises that that the promises of God would be fulfilled. That's like a definition of Mary. The reason she's blessed isn't anything other than this. She believed in the promises of God would be fulfilled. Mm. That faith is like what makes Mary Mary. What makes the disciple the disciple? What makes us who we are? What do we, it's like, will we live in that paradigm of faith or not? Will I walk according to uh, that which is unseen? Will I, we we walk by faith and not by sight, Mm. says St. Paul. I think Mary is that kind of disciple. She's she's not looking for the praises of men. She's not looking for um, creaturely goods to satisfy the hungers of her heart. But she's satisfied because Jesus is her joy. Wow. What a what a strong, powerful, courageous, 
admirable woman and model of faith for, for all of us. And she didn't look for the praises of men, but now this world's greatest poets and the most majestic angels sing her praises forever. So well, speaking of blessing, we should probably we, bless our audience. Let's do that. And I thought maybe we could use the text from the preface. Great Here's idea. A beautiful prayer from the church. Yes. It says this. For the Virgin Mary heard with faith that the Christ was to be born among men for men's sake by the sha- for overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit. Lovingly, she bore him in her immaculate womb that the promises to the children of Israel might come about and the hope of nations be accomplished beyond all telling. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you for coming to us through your mother Mary. And we pray that we might, like her, imitate this spirit of surrender, this fiat miki attitude, that every day we might be docile, ready and willing to accept the cross that leads to new life, unafraid, unafraid of what your will has, the little details of it, O Lord, because we know that story ends in glory. Give us this trust. Give us this, this faith that Mary had. Help us to be sons and daughters who take up her virtues in imitation of you. Lord, we thank you for this model of faith and Through her intercession, we pray for all of those who sincerely search for the truth, whether they be Catholics who are struggling with their faith, who are in a moment of crisis, a moment of growth, whether they be those outside of the church, atheists, agnostics. We ask that the Blessed Virgin, the model for all searchers, obtain for them that light, that grace to see the path of freedom and to experience the joy of being unrestrained by any sin. May Almighty God bless you, the The Father, Father, and the the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen.